This is now an opportunity for us to have uh, contributions from the floor, questions uh, from the floor. You've had two excellent presentations, uh, but perhaps insufficient disagreement between them. So we invite you to uh, challenge some of the arguments being made. Thank you for the lights going up. Uh, we have a colleague with a microphone. So I'm going to now invite you to make uh, your contributions, your questions. Please simply say who you are and please make the contribution uh, as short as, as possible. Uh, can I ask for questions uh, from the audience, please? Oh, thank you. Yes, here. Ευχαριστούμε, Ραυτόπουλος λέγουμε, ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ. Εκείνο που με προβληματίζει είναι εσείς οι οικονομολόγοι και οι πολιτικοί επιστήμονες ε, χρησιμοποιείτε λέξεις, επειδή έχω κάνει και πολιτική επιστήμη, βέβαια έχω, την έχω σπουδάσει, ότι δεν τοποθετήστε πάνω στο θέμα της ιδεολογίας. Ξεκίνησα από τη Σοβιετική Ένωση και σκέφτηκα ότι εκεί είχαν οργανώσει μια σοσιαλιστική αγορά. Και η Βουλγαρία τότε και να σήμερα είναι στην άλλη από εδώ, ε, τούτη πλευρά. Σήμερα πιστεύω ότι το ίδιο γίνεται και με την Ευρώπη. Ακριβώς πάει να γίνει μία αγορά, πάει να γίνει μία αγορά φιλελεύθερου, καπιταλιστικού, εσείς όπως θέλετε ορίστε το οικονομολόγοι, όπου ακριβώς προσπαθούν να οργανώσουν αυτή την αγορά, αλλά όμως χωρίς να λαβαίνουν υπόψη αυτή την ιδεολογία που υφέρπει πολλές φορές, αριστερά, δεξιά, ε, κεντροδεξιά, όλα αυτά τα σχήματα, κομμουνιστική αριστερά κλπ. Εκεί βλέπω δεν γίνεται καμία προσέγγιση. Και οι πολιτευτές όταν κατεβαίνουν δεν εξηγούν στον κόσμο ότι εγώ είμαι σε ένα κόμμα, έχω αυτή την άποψη και μάλιστα εδώ στην Ελλάδα δεν είμαι το κομμουνιστικό κόμμα, εγώ δεν το πιστεύω, λέει ότι εγώ δεν θέλω να φύγουμε από την Ευρώπη, καμία συζήτηση, ούτε βοηθάω, κάθομαι στην άκρη το ίδιο και οι ακροδεξίοι από εκεί. Ε, θέλω να πω ότι α, εσείς πώς το αντιμετωπίζετε αυτό το λαβαίνετε, υπόψη τελικά, δηλαδή τελικά θα μείνουμε όλοι στο μυαλό με μια φιλελεύθερη οικονομία και εκεί πρέπει να προσαρμοστούμε και νομίζω και να τελειώσω και να μην θέλω να με βοηθήσετε, αν αυτό πάει να γίνει στην Ελλάδα με αυτή τη συμφωνία, ότι ακριβώς θα γίνει, προσπαθούν να φτιάξουν μια αγορά, μας έστειλε η Αμερική μια ομάδα, μια ομάδα η Γαλλία, εδώ για να μας... Λοιπόν, μήπως έχουμε αυτή τη λεγόμενη οργάνωση πλέον αγοράς και εκεί είναι η λύση και καλύτερα να μας τα πούνε. Καθίστε εκεί, ξέρουμε εμείς, θα σας οργανώσουμε και λοιπά. Εκεί μπορείτε να μας βοηθήσετε λίγο κάπου. Δεν μπόρεσα να το καταλάβω. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Ευχαριστώ. But recently, they've made a change, and they're more focused on doing deals with China. They just started doing uh, one ruble swaps and uh, pricing oil in uh, one. Do you think, what are the, the implications of this? And the gentleman here, please. Uh, you spoke about hegemony. And the uh, hegemony Western European countries and the U U.S. for many for the last uh, 200 centuries was bringing an economic rent, because we have to accept that, that we were exploiting to a certain extent both oil-producing countries and also uh, countries which are producing raw materials. Uh, things have changed, you know, the last uh, 10, 15 years, and we have seen this shift in the terms of trade. And I have made some calculations. We might have lost something like, in terms of national disposable income, between 7 and 10 percent of GDP. Now, with the fall of uh, the oil price, part of it is, is reversed. But w what is important is that uh, this economic rent was giving to, the, you, to Europe this kind of uh, uh, possibility to have a very good social network. And now that we have lost it, how are we going to replace it? And this is what is happening in Europe. This is one question. The second question is that Europe has lost the Industrial Revolution. Industrial Revolution started, the new Industrial Revolution started in the States. And uh, with high tech. And I was surprised to read 
that 60% of the cash flow in the states, uh, non-financial sector in the states, in 2013, means real profits, not accounting profits, was coming from the high-tech sector. And only 15%, the next one was the health sector. In Europe, we have missed this industrial revolution, and therefore, you know, we, I think that uh, unless we catch up to a certain extent, you know, we're going for a long decay, which makes much more difficult to solve our internal problems. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Mick, do you want to begin? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Oh, so, uh, we'll take a, oh, sorry. a fourth one as well, please. Sure. Sorry. Thank you very much as well for the very interesting evening. Um, my name is Sophie Daskalaki, and I would like to ask Professor Cox, how critical do you stand um, over the view that uh, as long as the United States is the leader of innovation, it will be the leader of the world? Right, well, there's lots of questions and lots of issues to deal with. I, I, I won't interfere into the internal affairs of the Greek state. Good. I will leave that to you. Um, about the liberal market economy. Um, my own take on this, frankly, is that I'm not sure it is a liberal economy in the sense that liberals would have understood a liberal economy in the 19th century. I mean, the economy we have today is a, is, is a very mixed economy. I mean, even, even in my own country, which you know, is very strong on free markets, the role of the state, the role of government of intervention into the economy is just huge. It's, we're not in the 19th century any longer. You know, we've lived after Keynes, and it's made a difference. Even the United States, I point this out to my American friends on the Republican right. I said, you're not even a free market economy. The biggest spenders are, is in the military industrial complex, which is all government. So I'm not sure there is a liberal economy in the sense that uh, people normally understand it today. But maybe our colleague George or maybe Kevin will pick up on that one. Very quickly on Russia, I'm glad you asked me that question because I've just written a paper on it. So as they say, I'm hot off the press. Um, actually, uh, Russia and China, and I won't go into too much detail on this, one of the really important international changes which has been not observed very closely is the increasing rapprochement between, the increasing rapprochement between China and Russia over the last 10 years. It's not just over the last two or three weeks or two or three months or even over the Ukraine issue, about which China has been very supportive of Russia, by the way. Uh, don't think that they've been critical. They've not at all. They've, they've covered Russia's back on Ukraine. Whatever you may think of that, we have discussion. But China's been very supportive. What I try and argue is that in a number of areas, China and Russia have come to an a sort of an agreement a tacit agreement on certain kind of fundamental principles. They don't like an American domination of the world. They're clear on that. There are many principles that the West adheres to, intervention, liberalism, which they don't like either. Uh, both are, by the way, cooperating very closely on what they call internet sovereignty, which you can interpret as meaning, please don't interfere into the internal affairs of my state through the internet. Uh, and by the way, they've cooperated rather closely through the BRICS organization. I didn't go into that in very much detail. So I'm not saying they are exactly the same, and they clearly aren't. And the asymmetry in power between the two is huge. Russia is now going down, and, Russia is still, and China is still rising. So we'll have to wait and see. But I think we should be taking this relationship, not for any Cold War reasons, but just for strategic thinking much more seriously than we've been doing uh, so far. I think this is a long-term relationship. I won't call it an alliance. I will call it what they call it, a strategic partnership of significance, which they think will last for a very long time indeed. They want to diffuse the degree of power the United States has in this world. I mean, it's, it's like that. Even though they've, in a sense, both benefited from joining a Western order in some sense, though Russia much less so. On the quick question of a United States in innovation, uh, thank you for that question. I, I think this is part of the key of understanding, uh, you know, the American exceptionalism, this term that's often used. Um, it went through the most horrendous crisis in, in the 1930s and finally came out of it largely because of World War II. 
And then out of that, of course, was the establishment of its economic and strategic power of the post-war period, the American century. Uh, it went through another series of crises in the 1970s, and it's gone through another series of crises in the 2008. But as George said, I mean, the ability of the United States to recuperate and restructure and move forward in a relatively, I don't say easy way, is of course something which we in Europe must in some sense be envious of. Let me also say, and I'll be very political here, Obama's got it right, and I think some of our European colleagues have got it somewhat wrong. Obama has gone for expansion. He didn't care how many dollars he produced. He didn't care about getting the interest rates below zero. He didn't care about pumping money, by the way, into two car industries which would have collapsed otherwise, namely General Motors and Chrysler. He didn't care a damn. He was doing what Europeans used to do. <laughs> in a funny, funny sort of reverse way. And they've been very highly critical, as you well know ever since, of, of the policies being pursued by certain, certain member states of the European Union who will remain nameless here this evening. So, so it's innovation, but the other thing is, and it comes back to George's point, and I'll pass over to George now, on all the criteria of power that you mentioned, George, strong institutions, an ability to set rules, exportable institutions, ability to have global collective action, with the exception of George W. Bush. <laughs> I'll always throw that one in just for the record, just in case I get misunderstood. Um, and in an ability to dominate the hegemonic discourse. All, on all those five criteria you use, George, the United States has a big tick in quite a lot of those boxes. And by the way, just one final point. When I'm in China, and you know, Chinese colleagues are wonderful. I mean, fantastically interesting place to go. And I learned so much by being there. But one of the things I always say to them, I said, but you're always looking to the United States. You know, the point of reference isn't 5,000 years ago, you know, the Ming dynasty, although that may be part of the whole ideology, civilization, that's not unimportant. But their point of reference, I find, time and time and time again, isn't ancient history, it's the United States. They're fascinated by it and they don't like it. They kind of admire it but want to be like it. Um, I once said to my Chinese communist friends, you're more like the Americans than anybody else I've ever met. They nearly expelled me from China. <laughs> But it's, about, it's a question of materialism, individualism, and measurements of power and success. Very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. And by the way, 220,000 Chinese middle-class students are in American universities. They're voting with their feet. By the way, some of the central people in the central committee and in the, in the, in the, in the higher levels of the party, the first university they want to send their children to is not Beidar, PKU, it's Cornell, Harvard, or Yale. Doesn't that tell its own story? Thank you. Thank you. Can we go quickly to George? Um, just very quickly. Uh, uh, let me respond to the first question. Um, you raised the question of ideology and the importance of um, ideological differences. And indeed, uh, it, is, it is difficult to, um, to emphasize these in uh, environments that operate along the lines of important external constraints. I would say that the first exercise in such cases is to recognize what these constraints are and what is the degree of policy or institutional convergence or compliance uh, that they impose. However, having said that, I think it, it is even, even more uh, important to try to reflect on the ability and the chances of changing some of these, some of these rules if that, is, uh, if that is politically or historically possible. Um, we know from, from uh, history of, um, of, of, of uh, institutional change that institutions change as a result of their having become obsolete uh, in the case where they, they do not play the role anymore, they are not able to function by producing the desired results, they're not efficient anymore, or they change when coalitions change, when political dynamics on the ground or social interest dynamics on the ground or power balances in the field actually change and force a change of institutions. And it seems to me that the recent global crisis, whose results we are still experiencing in a very traumatic way, um, gives an opportunity to reflect on the, uh, on the potential of change, uh, but as long as you have a certain given order of rules, you cannot apply a model 
of divergence within this specific framework because we have seen uh, examples, cases of, for example, socialism in one country, as comparative political economists in the past have called it, and they failed and they had to converge because the rules of global interdependence or European interdependence were given. But having said that, it is important to revisit these rules and see whether some of them have uh, overlived um, their usefulness, and it seems to me that many of them have. Good, thank you. Uh, we have the opportunity for another round of uh, questions. I'm looking for the, yes, uh, lady with the microphone. Is the microphone? Uh, we've lost the, mic. we lo we've lost the microphone. 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 Okay, could we, could we take the gentleman uh, here, please? Uh, the third row back. Yes, indeed. I shall only pass a comment which is not mine. It focuses on the institutional aspect. When I was a, commission, a member of the European Commission, Jacques Delors once told me, what do you expect of a political union that has a parliament that does not legislate, a government, the commission, that doesn't take decisions, and a single currency that has not a single economic policy. That's all. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Reminds you of Charles de Gaulle saying, who could rule France with so many different cheeses? Uh, I think there's a, someone at the back I've just lost. Uh... Yes, thank you, here. Thank you. Thanasi Politis. I want to ask, με τόση εξέλιξη στην επικοινωνία και στην τεχνολογία, τι ήταν αυτό που δεν μπόρεσε να, να κάνει τον κόσμο να προβλέψει την κρίση που προέκυψε στην Αμερική. Και αν τέτοιο φαινόμενο ήταν η εποπτεία, ήταν αυτό που λένε δημιουργική καταστροφή, έπρεπε να γίνει για να φτιάξουμε καλύτερο σύστημα, και αν κάτι τέτοιο μελλοντικά γίνει στην Κίνα, με βάση τους νόμους της οικονομίας, Θα είναι τόσο απότομε και βιαίε αυτέ οι μεταβολέ που γίνονται στην οικονομία. Ευχαριστώ. And right at the very front, please. Uh, then perhaps just one more. Thank you. Uh, Ioannis Samoulidis, thank you very much for your presentations. My question is about the financial markets. Uh, don't, don't you think that uh, the, they are uh, one quite powerful mean for global hegemony? Thank you. Thank you. And the, the last question, could we take the gentleman here, please? Uh, the most important uh, fact in modern economy is the crisis. I think that the economies have not shown interest in funding a system which will help to avoid crisis. So do you have any idea how we avoid crisis by inventing a new economic system? I have already invented one and the name is synergism. We don't fight each other, we cooperate. You don't lose, I don't gain, we share. And the Chinese have published my system and they are trying to incorporate it in their own communist system. Do you think that we should spend more time on finding a new economic system? I'm submitting to you, to Professor Cox, I'm his name, Mikhail, is ancient Greek. Mikhail is the sender, Il is the son. He is the sender of the son. So uh, I'm offering my system to Mikhail. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, nice, simple questions for you, Mick. Yeah, uh, yeah. Got, well, first, uh, first, two minutes, please. First of all, I've never been called a god before, but thank you. <laughs> if you come from Ireland, the name Michael is an archangel. I stand on the right-hand side of God, uh, the Archangel Michael. So there's, a, there's also a Catholic side to this as well. 
I have no, I have no idea. How, I'm not sure. I mean, we've, we've, we've had feudalism. We've had the Asiatic mode of production. We've had socialism, actually existing socialism, market socialism. We've got free market, non-market varieties of capitalism. I hope the Chinese listen to you. At the moment, they seem to be doing quite well by not listening to the West at the moment. It's one of the things I kind of gain quite a lot from in China. We don't listen, we kind of buy into the globalization. We buy into that. We'll kind of go with, you know, com competition. We'll use our comparative advantage. But one of the things the Chinese often say to me is, well, we're not going to listen to you. If we listen to the IMF, we get nowhere. You know, I mean, if we listen to your kind of, you know, state-owned enterprises actually do function. They may not function, maybe over the long term, we're going to see all sorts of problems coming out in China, debt, too much building of apartments, which are not, you know, all these kind of things are there. But at the moment, they think they're doing quite well. And that is also part of my theme, really, in a sense, that I think they themselves think they're doing quite well without too much Western advice at the moment. Whether they can last for the, for the long term is another question. On financial markets, I'll, I'll, I'll pass that over to George. Uh, they're very difficult to disagree with. That's the only thing I would say. I've just been doing some history of the 1920s and of the Labour government that came into power in Britain in 1924. And the first thing they were told is, don't upset the bankers. Don't upset the markets. And they said, okay. And, uh, you know, they didn't do very well anyway. But it is extraordinarily difficult. But anyway, I'll leave that one over to George. On prediction of crisis, actually some people did predict the possibility of a financial crash in the United States. Nouriel Roubini, George Soros, a number did actually predict it. But who wants to listen to people telling you life's going to get worse? And also there was institutional bias in order to sorry, make George, sure that happened. Sorry, Mick, you don't know how topical you are. Oh, oh, really? I mean, well, who, who have I offended anyway? Well, anyway, the point, the point is the crisis has, was predicted. There were, I think, however, there were incentives not to listen. Uh, and there were incentives to discount, to use the term that Ben Bernanke used, to discount risk. So all the incentives worked to actually ignore every single piece of rational information you could get. I've since spoken to accountants. Uh, who've told me that they knew this two to three years before, that something extraordinarily bad was going to happen, but nobody wanted to call it. Nobody wants to call it before. And that also brings you to the question of prediction very quickly, because George made the point. How many things have we predicted over the last 25 years and got right? Nothing. Nietzsche vote. We didn't predict the end of the Cold War. We didn't predict the end of the Soviet Union. We didn't predict the Japanese economic crash. Uh, we didn't predict 9-11, we didn't predict 2008, and by the way, George, I'm not even sure we even predicted the rise of China, at least after 2001, so it's a very, very difficult thing to do. The future is a dangerous place, and this is part of my argument, too. There's a lot of futurology involved in this power shift argument. I mean, when dear old Goldman Sachs tells me that in 2050, I don't know what's going to happen next Friday. They know 2050 that China would be number one, India would be number three, and the United States would be blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, really? Well, actually, by the way, in 2005, the then head of the Federal Reserve, I'm sure you know his name, said we're never going to have another crisis. Okay? So, by the way, did the Chancellor of the Exchequer in my own dear country, Gordon Brown. We've solved it. Really? Uh, in the end, you don't disobey some fundamental economic laws and rules. That's the problem we live in, and maybe China's going to face up to that. Um, on the institute, that wonderful quote you, you gave on, 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 the European, on the European Union, I wish I, can I borrow that and plagiarize it? It's very good. On the, on, on the great quote, I think of the European Union, and I think of it like this, it's a very crude foreign policy analysis. In the early 1990s, when the collapse had happened in Central Europe, East Germany. Okay. I remember sitting around with some uh, guys at NATO. I, I was an academic, but I was talking to them. And they said, do you know we're going to offer Poland and Czechoslovakia a wonderful deal. It's called Partnership for Peace. Halfway house. And do you know what the Poles said? Get lost. We want the real thing. We want the real thing. We want real membership of a real organization with real rules and with American power behind it. I want to pick up the phone, 911, and I want to hear an American voice at the other end, yeah? And that's what they got. In a way, I think Europe is a halfway house. It's a halfway house. It's stuck between a, a world in which it was once 
in a world that it has to move towards. There's resistance, there's opposition, there's going to be screaming, don't even ask me what the British are going to do. I'm going to give, I've given up on that. I'm, I'm going to take Irish citizenship very soon, I think. But it does strike me, it's a, we're in a partnership for peace, but we're in a halfway house moment. And we don't have either the political leadership or the ability to move forward to where we know we need to go if we're going to move out of the situation we're in. And actually, restore Europe. You know, some, the, the, to, so all the strengths of Europe, and they are real, will express themselves fully and completely in the international system, rather than the miserable situation we find ourselves in at the moment. Thank you. George. <clears throat> I think we know by now enough on why, on why the crisis uh, occurred, the crisis, the financial crisis that started from the US. And if I were to summarize it, I would say two types of failures, cognitive failure and failure of political or regulatory will. Uh, the first had to do with the uh, belief, the rather naive belief that uh, markets are self-regulating, uh, efficient, an approach that tended to ignore market failure. Uh, and emphasize uh, only government failure. Uh, the second had to do with regulators and supervisors, first of all, having devised a system that was flawed, and second, uh, sleeping on the wheel when the uh, crisis was evolving. This was a crisis of un, um, uh, uncontrolled procyclicality uh, in a way that reminds us the typical features of any crisis is the succession of, of manias and crashes. Uh, Manias, Panics and Crashes is a superb book that, uh, of Charles Kindleberger, I think it's the, the absolute uh, economic history, uh, pointing out the, the, the same elements in every crisis, the exuberance when things go uh, well, uh, no one wants to spoil the party, as someone said, you know, why should you uh, predict a crisis if or in fact try to avert it if your salary uh, depends on the crisis not happening. Um, so it was a case of rational self-interest of people who were holding the decisions in, in the US and Wall Street leading to collectively suboptimal or catastrophic outcomes. Uh, back in 1999, a very mainstream neoclassical economist, uh, Jagdish Bhagwati, had uh, reminded uh, his uh, readers at the Foreign Affairs uh, Journal of what um, Lyndon Johnson had said when he was, um, sorry, Eisenhower, Eisenhower, when he was departing the White House, he said in the last day, he said, beware of the military industrial complex because it is leading the U.S. foreign and defense policy. And he said that this military industrial complex had been replaced by a new kind of complex, the treasury, as he called it, treasury Wall Street complex, in the sense that financial policy, financial regulation is being sort of dictated to, um, to fit the interests of Wall Street. That was said back in 1998 or so, then we had um, deregulation of Wall Street, and then this was the decade when uh, the, the, the seeds were sort of uh, uh, evolved that led to the crisis. So uh, let me leave it there. I think that we know why it happened. The important thing is to be able to prevent it from happening again. Thank you, George, very much indeed. Before I, um, we must close, uh, I'm afraid, before bringing matters to uh, a conclusion, can I just remind you that there are two further lectures uh, coming up in this uh, series. On Monday, the 23rd of March, um, Kevin Featherstone will be giving a lecture on the theme of European power and national democracy. Who's that? Um, Who's that? Who's that? Not an Oxford graduate, George. And then on the 23rd of April, uh, Professor Anne Phillips will uh, give a lecture with a fantastic title of The Politics of the Human. Beat that for a title. The of the human. Uh, but I'm sure, like me, you've enjoyed the discussion here this evening and the two excellent presentations. So can you please join me in thanking Professor Mick Cox and Yorgos Pagulatis. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.